Thank you all for uh, allowing me to come and uh, take the blessing of being here. Uh, it's always a blessing to pray with the Buddha David and the Buddha Daniel. Um, and uh, they keep inviting me year after year, so I'm uh, very thankful and uh, flattered. Um, so uh, Holy Week is is uh, one of those, um, uh, the culmination really of, of Christian worship in the church. And it ends on on Good Friday. And Good Friday is one of those kind of strange days. Um, and it's, it's a rough one for us to understand because it's a day that's kind of full of contradictions and uh, kind of flip-flops a little bit. It's a day of both light and darkness. Um, I mean, when you look at the icon in the back there, you'll see in the icon that within the icon, there's light and darkness. Um, and even on Good Friday itself, there's a little tradition in the church that we do that's also just a little contradictory. Um, while Jesus is alive, we keep the black. And then as soon as Jesus dies, we put up white. So even in the same day, the church is trying to tell us that in this day, there's both things, light and darkness, white and black. Um, and, and even during Apocalypse Night, we, as we're singing, the deacons, have this sort of bipolar thing going, right? We're halfway through the psalm, they're, they're singing, you know, Hazaini, they're singing a, a sad tune, and then halfway through they switch to a festive tune. And during the gospel, we'll read half of it in a sad tune and we'll switch to a festive tune. It's like there's, we're trying to make this transition um, between these, these two. And so there's this, this, this conflict that happens on Good Friday. And, and within Good Friday also, we see that lots of things kind of divide, right? And, and the first obvious division are the two thieves, right? You have one cross, two thieves, the same situation, everything's held constant, but one of them chooses light and one of them chooses darkness. Um, and we see this in lots of the characters on Good Friday. Uh, the apostles, you know, Peter chooses darkness and John chose light. And even among the Pharisees, some of the Pharisees were saying, you know, crucify him, crucify him. And yet we see that Joseph and Nicodemus from the Sanhedrin, they actually take his body and they put it in, in a grave. Uh, and even among the soldiers, we see some soldiers who are hurting him and spearing him and other soldiers who said, truly, this was the son of God. Uh, and that soldier, by the way, who said that he actually became a Christian and he died as a martyr uh, in the name of Christianity. His name is St. Longinos. So, on Good Friday, we have this, this darkness and this light coming from the same event. Um, but let's, let's just put a pin in that for a second, and we'll get back to that in, in a minute. Uh, during Lent, we heard this story about this man who was born blind. We heard it just a few weeks ago. And then the disciples asked Jesus, they said, who, who sinned, this man or his parents? And you have to ask yourself, why did they ask Jesus that question? Why did they ask him who sinned? Because it was stumping them. All right, so let me ask all of you a question. You know, when you, take, uh, when you go to college and you take Philosophy 101, the first question the professor asks to try to stump all the, the, the undergrads is what? How could a good God do bad, let bad things happen? Right? How does a good God allow bad things? And so we ask that question. How does a good God allow bad things? Why are there famines? Why are there, you know, genocide? Why is there a war, wars that have happened? And so we have to ask, was this man's blindness God's will? Did God want him to be blind? And how could a good God want something like that? We also read during Lent that someone was paralyzed for 38 years. Did God want him to be paralyzed? How could a good God want a man to be paralyzed like that? For 38 years. And so, of course, it's hard, if not nearly impossible, for us as humans, limited to understand God's will. We know that God is navigating us, He's guiding us, He's got a trajectory for our lives, and it's very difficult for un us to understand how that works um, while He still allows us to be free. And then we jump ahead to the the night before the crucifixion, Thursday, two nights from now, and we say, Jesus says to his father, Abba, Father, 
All things are possible to you. If you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And so now again, we see this interaction between God's will and the Father's, uh, God's will and Christ's will. And he's saying, remove this cup from me. I don't want this, but not what you, not what I will, but what you will. And again, this, this interaction between our will and God's will. So let's together kind of explore this um, to the best of our abilities and, and try to understand, you know, how, how God interacts with us. And so we have two things. We have man's will and God's will. And let's talk about the two separately. First, we'll talk about man's will. Man's will is very strong. Even in the very famous verse that Christ says, he says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If anyone desires to come after me. So here we have a choice. Man's will is the only thing that can stand up to God's will. At some level, it's stronger than God's will. I can choose to do anything I want. And I can hurt anyone I want. And people have chosen very, very bad things in the history of the world. And when God created man, he created him with this free will. And when he created him with this free will, God has to live with it. And, and, and God has to deal with the, with the consequences of man having a free will. In fact, he had to deal with it right off the bat, Adam. And Adam used his free will quite quickly <laughs> and used it to disobey God. And of course, we heard in the par parable of the prodigal son, the one before all of those, that the son said, give me half the money. I wish you were dead. I want half the money so I can go live with harlots. And the dad said, sure. And so after we see all of this, it's hard for us to even deny that man's will is so protected by God and so strong, and he can do any, literally anything he wants. Okay, so that's man's will. Let's talk about God's will. What is God's will? That one's simple. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Right? This is what, this is what God desires. And so let's look at Christ's life for a second. Was it God's will that Jesus die for us on the cross and be crucified and give us all salvation? Of course, right? This was the plan from the very beginning. In fact, St. Athanasius says that this wasn't plan B. This wasn't the backup plan that, you know, oops, Adam fell. What am I going to do now? I know I'll send Jesus and he'll fix it. No, this was always the plan from the very beginning, from the beginning of, of eternity. And so we know that this is... God's will. But then when you look at the story, you have to ask, well, how did it happen? Well, Judas was greedy, right? Judas sold him. The chief priests were envious. The Pharisees hated him. Pontius Pilate exerted authority because he didn't want an uprising, right? So lots of evil people had to do a lot of things. I mean, if you look at whose will this was, it was kind of the chief priest's will, wasn't it? And they're the ones who said crucify him. They're the ones who told Pontius Pilate to do it. So it wasn't wasn't it Judas's greed and the and the and the chief uh, the chief priests and the Pharisees? Wasn't it their will that Jesus be crucified? So God's will is love your neighbor as yourself. And did those people do that? Did Judas do that? Did the Pharisees do that? Did the chief priests and the tax collectors do that? No. They just did a lot of bad things. All of them in their own evil way did something that they chose to do. And yet all of it worked to, to fulfill God's will. And this is the mystery. This is what makes it really hard to understand. And there's a story about St. Anthony. It's kind of a fun story um, from the Bustan, from the Paradise of the Fathers. It says, when Abba Anthony thought about the depths of the judgments of God, he asked, Lord, how is it that some die when they're young while others drag on to extreme old age? Why are, there th why are there those who are poor and those who are rich? Why do wicked men prosper and why are the just in need? And he heard a voice answering him. Does anyone know what God answered Anthony when Anthony asked him these really big questions? He says, keep your attention on yourself. Mind your own business. In Tamelek. So he's basically telling him, I'm God. Why don't you just focus on you and let me do me? 
And so from the very beginning of time, from the very beginning of Christianity, we've always kind of wondered, why does this person who's so evil and so bad live such a good life? And this person who's, how could God do this? How can this be fair? And people have wondered this from the very beginning. And we all have crosses in our lives, every single one of us, right? Some of us have a very difficult husband. Most of you do. Some of us have a difficult wife, a sick child, problems at work, a bad boss, bad servants, bad priest, difficult in-laws, difficult mother-in-law. No, that's never the case. Children that are on the wrong path. Right? All of us have challenges, financial challenges, health issues, a sick parent, and they're all crosses, and they're all difficult. And so how do I, as a Christian, see these crosses that are coming at me? Are those God's will for me? Is that what God wants for me, to have a difficult in-law? And is it God's will that someone evil bring that to me? Is it God's will that someone, those people do those things to me? And that's what's difficult. And here we have to distinguish between two things. The actual deed, the thing that the person did, which they did with their own free will. And the situation that comes to us as a result of that action. And those are two very different things. And sometimes, and we do this a lot in life, we mix the two. We mix the, the situation with the person. And we assign all the characteristics of the person to the situation, right? So clearly it's not God's will that we hurt each other, ever. But what if someone lies about you at work? Someone wants to cover their own mistake, so they tell a lie about you, and they get you in trouble with the boss. And now you got fired. How's that situation? How do I process that as a Christian? So clearly, it's not God's will that someone slander you at work. That person, they chose it with their own free will, and they're going to face the consequences of that action between them and God. But here comes the difference. The consequence of that very difficult situation, that is from God. Me being fired, that does come from the hand of God. God allowed it. God assented to it. And so even though it happened from an evil person, I have to take the situation that comes and says, this I take from the hand of God. And we see this, right? We see this in the story of Job. Satan always asked God first. And God assented. And God said, yes. He said, can I do this to him? He said, yes. Can I do this? Yes. So everything that happened to Job did happen by God's will. And God assented to those things. And we see this, of course, even in the life of someone like uh, Pope Corellus, right? Very evil people doing horrible things to him, right? Even priests doing things to him. And yet he refused to, to take those things in a negative way. He took them from the hand of God. He allowed them to happen to him, right? And he, he took them patiently. And he took them as if from the hand of God, because if he doesn't take it patiently, he won't learn from it. If he just saw the person on the other end and said, no, I'm not going to accept this because that Abuna is evil, he wouldn't have learned the lessons that God wanted him to take from that situation. During um, the litanies that we're going to say here in a few minutes, the, I think the second or third litany, there's just one litany that I just love. It's better in Arabic, but I'll say it to you in English. Who through his power arranged the life of man even before his creation? Through God's power, he arranged the life of man even before my creation. So our lives are arranged, right? And this is why we say God is the Pantocrator, right? The icon of the Pantocrator, he's holding the whole world, right? And that's what we teach the kids. He's got the whole world in his hands, right? And so God allows these events in our life that are difficult and painful, he allowed Judas and the Pharisees and the chief priests and the scribes to do whatever they wanted. He allowed the soldiers to beat Christ. He allowed them to hit him. He, al he allowed that. And that was his will. So what was Christ's response to all of this evil? And here we can learn something very important for ourselves. He could have said, I'm not going to go to the cross. 
The cross came from the chief priests. They're just jealous. Judas is greedy. These soldiers are crazy. I'm not going to go to the cross. I don't accept it. It comes from evil. This is not God's will. These are bad people doing bad things. And he could have denied and said, no, thank you. But rather, he said the other thing. Right? He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. If you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. All things are possible to you. What's he saying? He's saying, I know you can stop this. Right? You're assenting to this. You're allowing this to happen. I'm going to take this from your hand. And so for every one of us, we have the Father allowing a horrible thing to happen. So by all measures, the cross is a horrible thing to happen. How could a good God allow a horrible thing to happen? Right? And so this is where we learn who Christ was and how he lives inside us. Every one of us has this bitter cup. Everyone has a problem. And whenever you think, oh, you know, those, those people have it made, that guy's got an easy life, she's got a great husband, they've got an easy, no one has an easy anything, right? If you look into anyone's life, everyone has difficulty. Everyone has a cross. And the problem we have, the difficulty we have is recognizing this cross, especially when it comes from other people, other evil people. Some crosses, they just come from the sky. Some crosses, someone gets cancer and that just, happens. But what happens if the evil comes at the hands of someone else? Then what? And that's the part we have trouble assenting to, ag agreeing to, accepting. One of those spiritual writers, writers says, it was not the father's will that anyone kill his son, nor did he inspire anyone to kill his son. He did will, however, that Jesus would freely be the sacrifice for the sins of mankind. He willed that Jesus would let himself be put to death. And so we miss this. We miss assenting to God's will because we see the evil behind it. And the problem is the problem of, of seeing the people behind the evil is we get too agitated. We don't want to listen. We don't want to accept. We don't want to we don't want to let the lesson happen to us. We push back and we fight and we become rigid. And when we become rigid, then we don't learn what God wants to teach us. And we can fall into a victim mentality. And this is something that we see a lot of, especially young people. There's a lot of victim mentality out there. Right? And the reason there's a lot of victim mentality is because people see the person and not the event. They don't see it coming from the hands of God. They say, he did that to me. Right? And forever I'm scarred. And we see this, right? We see people blaming their parents. They're saying, well, I'm messed up because my parents were messed up. And then you talk to the parents and the parents say, well, I'm messed up because my parents were messed up. And we can just keep going down the line and we, we all blame it on Adam. You know, if only Adam hadn't fallen, then we, you know, and people say that if only Adam hadn't fallen, we would have no problems, right? And the victim mentality goes, you know, all the way up the ladder, right? And so I, I want to share with you a story from the, the book of Samuel about King David. It's actually a pretty funny story. So King David was walking along with his soldiers and someone from the family of Saul, who, if you remember, was the king before David, who was trying to persecute David, who ended up, you know, um, dying. He started throwing rocks at David and cursing at him. Okay, it's almost like a scene from Monty Python. Right? You have this king walking with his army around him, right? And this guy just like throwing little stones saying, hey, you're this, you're that. And he starts throwing rocks at David, right? And in fact, the things that he's saying are not even true. They're saying, you know, he's saying stuff about David that actually is factually false. So then King David's guard turns to the king and says, and I like this, he says, why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over and cut his head off, right? So this is what the soldier says. He says, let me go cut his head off. Right. But then David has this amazing response. He says, what does this have to do with you? He says, like, you know, just back off. If he is cursing because the Lord said to him, curse David, then how, who can ask, why do you do this? So look what he said. He continued, leave him alone. 
let him curse me, for the Lord has told him to. So now David is taking this cursing from this man who shouldn't be cursing, who shouldn't be throwing rocks, who is wrong, probably crazy. And he says, let him curse, the Lord has told him to. You see how David distinguished when he said, this person may be wrong, but I'm going to take this situation from the hand of God himself. So even cursing he took from the hand of God. St. Nectaria says, creation must be subject to the will of God, and thus nothing happens without God's permission or outside of the divine will. Thus everything happens with divine assent and approval. And so sometimes when we start focusing on the people, we start focusing on the mother-in-law, we start focusing on the, the bad boss, we start focusing on the servant, we start focusing on whomever, we can lose track of the fact that God has allowed it for us, for our purification, for our growth, for our strength, for us to get closer to him, for us to look up. And so now it's our free will, it's my turn to use my free will and look up and say, I'm going to accept what God has given me. And that's our choice. Do I accept it or, I, or do I reject it? And do some people look at a cross and reject it? Does that happen? Yeah, all the time. All the time. You know, you, you say, well, God sends us these crosses so that we get closer to him. Look at that guy over there. He got the cross and now he denied God and he hates God and he's angry. Yeah, that happens. Right? In fact, it happened at the very first cross, didn't it? Right-hand thief, left-hand thief. One of them wanted God and one of them didn't. One of them said, get me off this cross. I'm not interested in your cross. So yes, we get crosses and then we get to choose and it's completely up to us. So let's go back to the beginning. Is the light, is the cross light or darkness? It's both. And who gets to pick? You do. The cross comes and you choose. You choose light or you choose darkness. St. Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So is the cross foolishness or power? It's both. It just depends on which one you pick and which side you want to be on. And again, this dichotomy is everywhere in the day of the cross. The thieves and the apostles and the soldiers and the Pharisees, left and right, light and darkness, over and over again. So when I pick light and I pick the right thing and I choose to be patient in the face of a cross and meek and humble and bear this cross with, with, with all kinds of endurance, these are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And where does this fruit come from? Does it come from me or does it come from God? Both. So when the cross comes, I have to choose to struggle. And that's the only thing I get to choose. Do I struggle or don't struggle? But the victory comes from God. It doesn't come from us. The victory only comes from God. Such that when I get the victory, I know and all of us know it wasn't me. That was all God. So I can struggle and wait for the victory that comes from God. And you can see this, there's little subtleties. You know, in the story of Lazarus, there's this like funny part, right? Where Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead, which is pretty amazing. Okay. But then what does he ask to do first? He says, can you guys roll away the stone? And you're like, really? You can't roll away the stone? Like, what if the story had gone and Jesus waved his hand and the stone rolled away? We'd be like, yeah, okay, no problem, right? I mean, if he can raise someone from the dead, he can probably roll away a stone. He calmed the oceans and he made, you know, five loaves into feeding five thousands of people. So if the story had just said he rolled the stone, but he didn't, he said, can you roll it for me? Why? He wanted to give them just that little bit, right? I want you to just give me, just, you just roll away the stone and I'll raise the dead but you have to do that little piece, right? You give me the five loaves and I'll feed everybody else, right? And that little piece is our struggle. And then God gives the victory. Sorry, I have to blow my nose. 
It's a good mic. Kids like my jokes. Okay. You should talk to my wife. Maybe they'll uh... So um, I'm almost done. So St. John Cassian, who some of you may know, is um, the, he, he was a, a Westerner, but he went to the, the, the deserts of Egypt and he had these dialogues, they're called conferences, with monks. And he would write down these long inner, inner interactions with them. Um, but anyway, he, he talks about this interplay between my will and God's will and my effort and God giving the, the, the fruit. He says, for it is foolish if when, for example, a farmer, we see the farmer taking the utmost pains over the cultivation of the grounds, we do not ascribe the fruits to his exertion. So he's saying when we see a farmer work really hard, of course we're going to say the farmer worked really hard, and those fruits are the labor, are the fruit of his labor, right, of his exertion. But now the farmer who worked really hard, has to recognize that he didn't do it alone. St. John continues, For neither can the farmer, when he has worked hard in cultivating the ground, immediately ascribe the produce of the crops and the rich fruits to his own exertions, as he finds that they are often in vain unless opportune rains and a calm, a quiet and calm winter aids them. So he's saying the farmer knows that it has to rain at the right time, the winter has to be mild, and the weather has to be good. So the farmer knows I have to work hard, but if I can work as hard as I want, but if the rain doesn't come, none of my crops grow. And so St. John Cassian is telling us it's, it's sort of like that, right? We're a farmer and we're going for the, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We work hard, we toil in the ground, but ultimately the rain has to come and the weather has to be helpful and the sun has to shine at the right time for everything to happen uh, together. Okay, so I'll kind of, so there are many crosses that come to us, there are many difficulties, and we have to struggle, but it's very important in everything, distinguish between the person and the situation. The person who is doing evil, who is trying to harm you, who has bad motives, the Judas, the chief priest, the whomever. And the situation that you arise, that you then assent to as Jesus did and said, not my will, but yours. And it's okay to say, remove this cup from me. It's okay to say, all things are possible for you, Lord, remove this cup from me. That's okay. But in the end, assign your will to God's. Relinquish. And so when we take the cross to this path of victory, when we choose the cross as light and not darkness, we get rid of despair and depression and victimization, blaming others, becoming bitter. And there are people who are just bitter because in their lives, every interaction, I was like, well, my boss did that thing to me and ruined my life. And my wife said that thing. And my mother-in-law did this. And my child did that. And they victimize themselves and they blame others. And that breeds bitterness. And what God tries to teach us is distinguish between the two. So we just need to offer the first step. We just need to roll away the stone and let God resurrect what's inside us. So I'll end with a I'll end with a poem, uh, a letter. It's this letter. Some of you may have heard. It's called "This Was from Me." It's actually a famous letter by a guy named Saint Seraphim. He sent it to his spiritual child, who's a bishop, in a Russian prison. So this is quite recent. Um. And it's a consolation to this bishop because the bishop obviously, you know, the, 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 the Russians, the communists were, were killed tens of thousands of priests and bishops um, and they were torturing them in these prisons. And so I'm sure this guy's life wasn't great. Um, and so this, 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 uh, the saint wrote him this, um, this letter. And I think it sort of sums up what we uh, are talking about today. He said, have you ever thought that everything that concerns you concerns me? You are precious in my eyes and I love you. For this reason, it is a special joy for me to train you. When temptations and the opponent, the evil one, come upon you like a river, I want you to know that this was from me. I want you to know that when you're in difficult conditions, among people who do not understand you and cast you away, this was from me. I am your God. The circumstances of your life are in my hands. 
you did not end up in your position by chance. This is precisely the position I have appointed for you. Your environment and those who are around you are performing my will. Do you have financial difficulties and can just barely survive? Know that this was from me. Have you ever spent the night in suffering? Did your friend or someone to whom you opened your heart deceive you? This was from me. Your plans were destroyed. Your soul yielded and you were exhausted. This was from me. Unexpected failures found you and despair overcame your heart. Serious illness found you, which may be healed or may be incurable and has nailed you to your bed. This was from me. Remember always that every difficulty you come across, every offensive word, every slander and criticism, every obstacle to your works which could cause frustration and disappointment, this is from me. Know and remember always, no matter where you are, that whatsoever hurts will be dulled as soon as you learn that in all things to look at me. Everything has been sent to you by me for the perfection of your soul. All things were from me. May the Lord give us blessing this week as we move toward the cross and learn so much from the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And glory be to God forever.